So hello and welcome to today's webinar, Poppers, the ban on alkyl nitrates in Canada and its impacts on GBMSM health. My name is Henry Wu. I am a research investigator with CBRC, the community-based research center for game and health, and I'll be your moderator today. To start, I would like to let our audience know that you are automatically muted for the presentation duration of the webinar, as there will be opportunities for questions afterwards. Feel free to enter questions into our chat box at any time, and our presenter will ask, answer them after the presentation has ended. Make sure to address your questions to the host in the chat box by selecting the Ask Host option in the drop-down menu under the Q&A section. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CBRC YouTube page after the presentation. Today's webinar is a continuation of CBRC's webinar series, which delves into topics and issues pertaining to our community of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men and beyond. CBRC has a number of programs, including the GBMSM Health Network, but also the annual Gay Men's Health Summit and the Periodic Sex Now Survey, uh, which has already launched for the summer. For those of you who don't know, the GBMSM Health Network is dedicated to connecting people and organizations in BC who are working to better the health of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, including trans and two-spirit men. I would like to thank P PHSA, the Provincial Health Services Authority, for sponsoring this webinar series and making it possible for CBRC to continue to host knowledge exchange opportunities such as these ones. As well, I would like to thank our presenter, Cameron Schwartz, for joining us today to make this discussion possible. Today we get to hear about poppers. Poppers, or alkyl nitrites, are used by roughly 30% of gay men in Canada, often in nightlife or sexual contexts. Though they were sold off-label for many years as leather cleaner or room odorizer, for example, the federal government has banned their sale entirely in 2013. Formal reasoning for the ban was not given publicly and potential impacts on community health remain unclear. This webinar uses a harm reduction informed sex positive lens to investigate following. What poppers related health problems are relevant to gay men in Canada? What impacts has the poppers ban had and how can we respond as stakeholders in the community? Today's presenter is Cameron Schwartz. Cameron Schwartz is a Master of Public Health candidate at Simon Fraser University and is currently investigating the use of poppers in Canada. Cameron has been involved in substance-related health programming since 2014, working as a harm reduction outreach worker and program manager. Prior to this, he worked in a lab to analyze samples on behalf of the Drug and Poison Information Center. Improving access to evidence-based drug information remains the strong theme as his career develops in the field of gay men's health. At this time, I would like to turn over the reins to Cameron. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, Henry, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about poppers, otherwise known as alkyl nitrate. Um, so to preface this, yeah, this is part of my involvement with CBIC. I'm a practicum student here in the summer as well. Uh, so this webinar is intended largely for service providers in the gay men's health community, um, but it's also relevant to anyone who has an interest in the topic. Uh, so today we're going to be focusing most mostly on uh, health impacts and general health outcomes associated with alcohol nitrate use or poppers use, um, as well as halfway through um, we'll tie in the policy side of things, what's happened with poppers recently in Canada and where can we go from there. All right, so just a bit more of an outline for today. Uh, so I'm gonna cover some background. So what are poppers for those who are less familiar? Uh, why are people using poppers? What are some potential health risks that we should be aware of? as well as addressing common misconceptions that a lot of people seem to have. Then, yeah, about halfway through, we'll kind of switch gears, talk more about the policy side of things. So the poppers ban, what happened, uh, how it's impacted gay men, and then where do we go from here? So how can service providers specifically respond? So what are poppers? Um, you can see some examples there on the bottom. So they're sold in little glass vials, often branded, um, you know, colorful kind of imagery. Some poppers refer to a family of chemicals that are called alkyl nitrites. Um, the most common and the original poppers uh, refer to amyl nitrate and isobutyl nitrate. Uh, but in recent years, we're seeing other chemicals take, those, uh, take the place of things like amyl nitrate, and we'll talk more about that when we get to policy. Uh, so poppers are inhaled. They result in short-lasting effects, so generally around uh, 30 seconds to two minutes. They're very short-acting. 
And what they do, what they do in the blood is they, um, or what they do in the body, I should say, is they release nitric oxide in the blood. Uh, so what that does is it stimulates the um, blood vessels as well as the smooth muscle, so it relaxes smooth muscle, and it actually dilates blood vessels. And we'll get in more of the implications of that in a second. Um, so poppers were sold off-label for a long time, uh, generally in sex shops. Uh, so you could walk in and you could buy these things. I could recognize brands and buy them in stores. So why is this relevant? Um, poppers are used by roughly 30% of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in Canada. So that's, you know, that's a large number of people. Uh, these numbers are, you know, fairly constant in other parts of the world as well. So almost a third of gay and other queer men in Canada. This is relating to sex now data, so it's across the country, um, and that refers to generally use in the past 12 months. So despite a really high prevalence of poppers use, there's actually a lot of confusion over the ban. Uh, so whether poppers are legal, whether they're illegal, uh, and there's also a lot of misinformation around the health effects of poppers. Okay, so here are just some examples of headlines from the news. Um, you know, obviously they're very uh, evocative titles. Uh, one thing I'm gonna try to do today is address, you know, how real are these concerns, whether this is something that we should be, you know, spreading around, uh, and yeah, how can we tie that into evidence? Okay, so to preface this, I'm gonna talk more about the benefits of poppers use. Uh, so a lot of substance use research, specifically the academic side of things, uh, tends to avoid any realistic benefits of substance use. Um, oftentimes they're largely ignored or they're like glazed over, um, but the reality is people use drugs for a reason and by ignoring that side of the conversation, that's not gonna help get us anywhere. Um, so the reality is there's a lot of reasons why poppers are popular. Um, notably, they make clotomy easier. So I said before, they work in the body to relax smooth muscle, so that has a very uh, practical uh, implication for anal sex. So one reason they're popular among gay men is they actually make bottoming easier and less painful. They also work to, um, this is thought to be caused by an increase of blood flow to the brain, so they give a short rush. Again, it doesn't last very long, kind of a 30 second to two minute range, uh, and it's characterized by warm feelings of warmth and dizziness. I've just included a quote on the bottom there uh, from a researcher named Thomas Lowry. He studied mostly sexuality. He was a psychiatrist, but he was referring to poppers as the closest thing that exists to a true aphrodisiac. So, you know, clearly there are some real benefits of poppers use, and there's a reason why they're used by so many people. Just switching gears a bit again, um, talking more about the risks. So, some common side effects, these are things that, you know, a lot of people have experienced. Uh, for the most part, these are the only uh, real side effects that most people are going to encounter. So those are headaches and skin irritation. Headaches are very common. Um, skin irritation actually refers to uh, a mild form of chemical uh, burn to the skin. So when you actually expose the popper, the popper chemical itself as opposed to just inhaling it, the one poppers actually get on your skin, they can cause some irritation, but that generally goes away pretty quickly. Other considerations that I'm gonna talk about uh, include immunosuppression and viral transmission. Uh, so we'll get into those right now. So immunosuppression. When they first started studying poppers, uh, a lot of research began in the early 80s. Poppers were shown to damage the immune system in mice. So essentially what they looked at is they counted the white blood cell count before and after exposing mice to poppers and they noticed that the number of white blood cells actually decreased in the mice that were exposed. Uh, they tried to apply these findings in humans. Um, generally, they observed a modest decrease in certain white blood cell counts. Um, so one of those was natural killer or NK cells. And you can see on the right there, there's a picture of a natural killer cell attacking a target. So yeah, I think it's worth noting that these uh, blood cell counts did return to normal after about a week, so these were temporary effects. But what does this mean? So what do natural killer cells do? Uh, this is gonna be a bit of a reductionist explanation, but one of their main um, uses in the body is natural killer cells target cells that have been infected by viruses or cells that appear cancerous, and they go in and kill those cells. 
Okay, so what does this mean? Is this gonna have a noticeable effect for most people? This isn't something that people tend to refer to as uh, you know, effective pop disease. Most people aren't gonna notice it in the day-to-day -day life. Um, but a recent study published just last year uh, has, has associated this decrease in natural killer cells to um, an increase in viral associated cancer risk. So for example, they look specifically at cancers caused by HPV, cancers caused by other um, viral STIs, so HHV8, um, and they are associated with slightly elevated increases in or slightly elevated risks for cancer. Okay, so moving on to viral transmission. Uh, so what do we really know about STIs and viral transmission, or poppers and viral transmitted STIs, I should say? What we can say for sure is that among people who happen to be using poppers, there's also there also happens to be an elevated risk of viral STI transmission. So again, what does this mean? So it could be related to immune function. So I was talking before about natural killer cells. It's possible that um, when poppers are used during sex, a decrease in natural killer cells makes it easier for viruses to take hold in the body. Another possibility is, I was talking before about their vasodilatory effects. Um, so they make the blood vessels dilate. And one effect that that has is that blood vessels are thinner. And so it's possible also that poppers make viruses easier to enter the body originally because the blood vessels are thinner. Uh, and generally that refers to you know, sexual transmission. It's worth noting though that this viral transmission, uh, the findings that were observed in research are generally contested and they have been for quite some time. So some people think that uh, even though researchers looked at, they tried to control for things like number of sexual partners or whether or not people use condoms, there are some things that are very hard to control for in these kinds of studies. For example, whether people are maybe having sex for longer when they use poppers or maybe people are having slightly rougher sex. There's a lot of other factors that are hard to control for. Um, so at this point, it's hard to say definitively whether there's a real causal association with this viral transmission increase. Okay, so just again, putting this research in context. Um, there are many, many reports. Uh, I think most people who have used poppers for a very long time were probably not gonna notice any serious side effects. Although of course, headaches and you know minor burns on skin are pretty common. Um, some experts in drug policy even consider poppers uh, to be one of the safest recreational drugs that we have. That said, you know, like any drug, there are some health risks to be aware of. Uh, we talked about immunosuppression and viral transmission. Generally, more research is needed around poppers to really firm up those findings. Okay, so I'm gonna touch on some misconceptions around poppers use. So like before, those headlines, um, you know, very sensational, how much of this is really true. The first one I talk, want to talk about is poppers related overdose. And I want to bring this one up partly because it's listed on Health Canada's um, reference page for poppers. Um, so they essentially say that it's, you know, possible to overdose on poppers and some of these overdoses are fatal. So these substances are very dangerous. Um, but, you know, how grounded this in this, or how grounded in reality is this? Uh, so it's definitely possible to overdose on poppers. So I'll say that right away. Um, you can look at that diagram on the right showing a uh, regular red blood cell and another um, red blood cell with a form of hemoglobin changed to methemoglobin. Um, so I'm talking a bit about the chemistry because what happens when you use poppers is that some of that hemoglobin in your blood um, actually gets converted to that other kind of methemoglobin, it's called. And so that actually inhibits the body's ability to carry oxygen throughout, or yeah, oxygen throughout the blood. So in severe cases, when people use a lot of poppers or potentially drink from a poppers bottle, um, that increase in methemoglobin, decrease in regular hemoglobin, means that their body can no longer carry enough oxygen to support themselves. And in very rare cases, it can be fatal. Um, that said, treatment does exist for this. So if you show up to the ER and you have a case of what's called methemoglobinemia, um, they can either give you a blood transfusion or there's something called methylene blue. So essentially there are a couple really valid ways to reverse a poppers overdose in a hospital. 
So I've listed this as a misconception because it doesn't appear to be very, very common at all. Um, this is again a quote from Thomas Lowry talking about pauper's use. Uh, he says approximately 250 million recreational doses are consumed every single year in the United States. These are numbers from the 80s, um, but they're still fairly relevant today. And at that point, there had been no known deaths from inhalation at all. So yes, pauper's overdose is possible. It's, it appears to be exceedingly rare. The second misconception I want to talk about is Viagra and Popper's use. Um, so there have been, you know, a lot of people have referred to this idea that using Viagra and Popper's together appears to be very dangerous and can cause, you know, acute problems. Part of this comes from a statement that Pfizer issued, uh, I think in 1998. Um, so they said there was a contraindication between Viagra and Popper's. Um, essentially, they, they, they were saying that there are some serious side effects or that people should be worried about using them together. Um, I'll say that this is, you know, based on something that's biologically plausible. Their reasoning was that because poppers are a vasodilator, they lower your blood pressure. Uh, so is Viagra, also lowers your blood pressure. So they thought that sudden increase in blood pressure, or sudden decrease, I should say, in blood pressure could cause serious implications for heart problems. Um, again, something that's plausible. Uh, but why I'm listing this as a misconception now is because out of this literature review that I did, I did not find any real cases related to Viagra and Poppers or any acute health concerns that were cited in the literature relating to Viagra and Poppers use. Um, right, so I am not suggesting that everyone go out and push their boundaries in terms of using these two substances together. However, um, it doesn't appear to be causing tons of problems around the world and because uh, poppers are used so prevalently, obviously so is Viagra. Um, it's generally considered that we'd expect to see more issues arising, uh, and those just don't seem to be published. Okay, uh, so now shifting gears, talking a bit more about the policy. So again, um, poppers overdose, as well as the contraindication between poppers and Viagra were both listed on the Health Canada website. Um, and up until recently, you could buy poppers in stores. But what changed in 2013, and this is in the title of the webinar, uh, the poppers ban, uh, what changed then is that Health Canada cited a bunch of risk factors for poppers um, and essentially cracked down on their sale. So in all technicality, poppers have been illegal to sell since 1985. This is uh, because they're classified as a drug under the Food and Drugs Act. But I mentioned earlier that they're being sold off-label, um, so that's often as room odorizer or um, leather cleaner or other things like this. So they kind of like slipped under the radar of the Food and Drug Act for a long time. In 2013, Health Canada said that, no, we actually have to crack down on these. You know, they apparently are causing health issues. Uh, so they made the sale of the poppers illegal. That said, there were no charges for buying or possessing poppers. So it's still very legal to possess poppers. Um, there are no charges for buying or possession. So what does this actually change? Um, poppers are still very popular among gay men. That number that I originally cited, about 30% of people using poppers, um, that was actually numbers from after the ban. So, Numbers before the ban and after appear to be very similar. There may have been a slight decrease. But by and large, people who were using poppers before are still using them now. So obviously that means they have to be getting them from somewhere. So people, uh, you know, it's fairly well cited that people are buying poppers from dealers. They're buying them online. They're bringing poppers in across the border. Uh, and what are the implications of this? So poppers today, are generally different than the ones that were being sold before the ban. Um, so early on, I was saying the original popper chemical was called amyl nitrate. Um, now, since the ban, we're seeing new chemicals arising. So things like isopropyl nitrate, things like chlorhexyl nitrate, and these have variable toxicities uh, and appear to be causing different health concerns than the original popper's compound. Um, another thing that we're seeing is a total lack of regulation. Um, so there's even dealers making poppers at home, for example. Um, there's no sense uh, of guaranteed factory uh, 
quality control anymore. Uh, so really it's impossible to tell what you're buying. And this is obvious through fake branding. So you can see on the right, uh, there's an image of what is supposedly a real bottle of jungle juice or a real um, amyl nitrate containing poppers brand, and then a fake. Um, so essentially now even, you know, with known brands, people are going out and they're thinking they're buying one substance and they're actually buying another, and there are some health concerns associated with that. Most notably, I want to talk about puffer's maculopathy. So this is a novel health concern. So it hasn't been really been shown up or it hasn't been seen uh, since or prior to the 90s. Uh, and so this is associated specifically with new types of nitrate compounds. So what happens in Popper's maculopathy is it's a form of central vision loss. Um, so people generally get blurry vision around, you know, the center of their vision. And in some cases, this means they have to take time off work. Um, it has serious complications for, for people. Um, it's worth noting that this generally goes away after stopping using poppers, but not in every case. Now this hasn't, you know, it hasn't been around long enough to really pin down the true cause. There are some theories. Um, however, it does appear to be particularly associated with, yeah, this one compound called isopropyl nitrate, and this is something that showed up more after the ban. Um, it's also often cited um, patients report changing poppers chemicals or changing poppers brands. So it appears to have some connection to, you know, differences in regulation, some connection to a change in what's available on the market. So tying this into drug policy overall, there's a lot of parallels that we can see. Uh, so the first is that prohibition has not led to abstinence. Um, I think this is something that, you know, comes up over and over again in drug policy. Uh, we can see the most clear example, even in Canada, of alcohol prohibition. So the government tried to ban the sale of alcohol. Of course, that didn't work. Um, people continue to use that substance as they continue to use poppers. Uh, so we can see, you know, the numbers before the ban for poppers in Canada were about 33% or so, 33% of gay men in Canada or GBMSM in Canada. The numbers after the ban are about, you know, 29, 30%. So really only a marginal decrease in the number of people who are using poppers largely did not change behavior. Um, like other examples in drug policy, this has created an unregulated market. So people don't know what they're buying. There's no way to uh, ensure quality control. And this is actually appears to be causing negative health effects in the population. I'd also like to note uh, another parallel in drug policy, and that's what I'm gonna call a paternalistic approach. Um, and I'm calling it this because the government essentially, you know, cracked down on the sale of poppers. Um, they went to law enforcement and they, um, went to border control, for example, they tried to make sure that no poppers could get in people's hands. Um, well, what they didn't do is that they didn't um, spread any health messaging related to poppers use. They didn't fund any research as far as I'm aware. Um, they didn't actually evaluate the ban as a public health strategy. And, you know, that's quite common in looking at other substance use, even around the world and drug policy as well. Okay. So what can we do as a community? So in the meantime, we can't really change the proper supply. We're kind of limited by the available research and what we can say about poppers. However, we can continue raising awareness about the popper ban. We can continue raising awareness about valid reasons to use poppers, about potential health effects related to poppers, but we can avoid spreading misinformation. Um, so just tying again back to those headlines uh, and those newspaper articles, so we can avoid spreading information that's not based on fact. And lastly, of course, we can start talking about poppers using real evidence, using what we do know uh, from the research. So lastly, I'm going to talk just uh, briefly about what GBMSM service providers can do. So again, uh, no need to spread panic. I, you invite people to uh, make their own opinions about popper use, their own opinions about you know, the impact of the popper ban. But I would suggest that there's no need to immediately spread uh, you know, concern or panic that's not based on evidence. Uh, 
lastly, I'd like to suggest using non-stigmatizing language. So this is something that can be applied to all sorts of conversations around drug use, generally can be considered, you know, a mentality that people bring to the table. Um, some examples, for those who are interested, you know, oftentimes in the literature, people refer to offers abuse or inhaled nitrite abuse. Um, you know, blanket terms for drug abuse don't necessarily make people feel very comfortable talking about substances. Um, so instead, what you might say is, um, you know, referring to people who use poppers or referring to poppers use. Um, lastly, I'll say it might be helpful to only bring up poppers if it's relevant to the conversation. Again, drawing from the medical literature and what they're suggesting is, um, you know, they, they suggest for doctors to, if they think people are using poppers, to kind of interrogate them. So, uh, ask them about their poppers use if they're a gay man or think that, you know, they have other risk factors for using poppers. So, ask them about their poppers use and kind of immediately counsel them on the effects. Um, I'd suggest that in opening up a conversation about any kind of substance use, it's easy uh, or it might be helpful to bring it up only when you know it might be helpful or relevant to the individual. Um, right, so how might poppers come up naturally then? And there are a few examples. Uh, so one, if you're interested in talking about poppers related to health effects or the ban on poppers, um, they might come up naturally in certain settings like bathhouse testing or any kind of bathhouse outreach. So these are, you know, places where people tend to be using more poppers. They might come into a testing room with some poppers as well. And if they're interested in learning a bit more about the health effects, that could be a good way to start a conversation. Um, they're also included in some versions of the HERI score. So the HERI score is an assessment for uh, determining eligibility for PrEP. Uh, that's how it's used in BC anyways. Uh, essentially, it's a series of questions that ask what someone's um, susceptibility or what someone's um, predisposed risks are to getting HIV. And one of the questions that was asked in earlier versions and still sometimes used is whether or not people use poppers. So again, that's a good way to bring up uh, poppers naturally. Uh, it's a good way to start that conversation if folks are interested in learning a bit more. Um, lastly, poppers might come up naturally if people talk about things like central vision blindness, um, you know, something that you might think could be related specifically to poppers use. Um, that could be a good time to raise uh, some conversation around poppers use uh, in a way that's supportive. Great. Uh, so these are the references that I, the references that I used in the slides. Uh, but this is, you know, drawing largely on information that's not referenced here. So if you'd like any more information about one particular area, uh, please contact me, and I'm happy to follow up with that. Um, yeah, so this is my information here. Um, yeah, so please contact me, and if you have any live questions now, I am happy to answer them. Okay. Um, so I'd just like to thank our presenter, Cameron Schwartz, for his excellent presentation today. So again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, make sure to address your questions to the host in the chat box by selecting ask the Ask Host option in the drop-down menu under the Q&A section. Um, otherwise, uh, you can also address the group as well by selecting all participants. Um, we will leave the WebEx platform open for about 10 to 15 minutes as we wait for questions to come in. Okay, so there's a, a clarification in the Q&A section. Um, so the theory assessment tool is not necessary for First Nations and Inuit people wanting PrEP. So that's just a clarification there. Um, and another question for Cameron. Um, can you let people know that we are going to pursue this further with Health Canada? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so there isn't a lot of publicized information from Health Canada on the ban. Um, so one thing that we're considering doing is writing a briefing note, for example. Um, we are currently in contact with folks from Health Canada to find out a bit more about the ban, um, yeah, how it came up, where, you know, this legislation might go in the future. So we're trying to open up that conversation.
and thank you also for the clarification of uh, the hearing scale for other men in BC. That's helpful. Okay, um, and so we have a. Uh, so we have another question here. Um, are there any code terms that refer to poppers in online hookup apps or dating sites? Any terms? Yes. Um, none are coming to mind. I think poppers is the most, you know, colloquially referred to uh, term, but I think there might be some that I'm, yeah. Some people refer to, I guess, branding as well. Uh, so some people talk about Rush. Um, I think, yeah, that, that refers to a brand of poppers, or they might be talking about Jungle Juice, for example. Um, yeah, I think generally poppers is the most common term, but there are some others floating around as well. Okay, and another question, can we use nitrous oxide uh, whippets instead of poppers for a similar effect? Um, I'm hesitant to make any like serious claims just off the cuff. Uh, nitrous oxide has, you know, in some ways I think it's similar. It's inhaled, it has fairly short, out, short lasting effects. I'm not familiar of any similar association, you know, given the context, uh, yeah. I probably wouldn't, yeah, I don't have a lot to say there, I think, but, you know, it might be something worth researching more if you're interested. Great. Um, and then someone is wondering if they will be receiving copies of the slides. Um, if you're interested, maybe you can follow up with me privately, but it will be posted on YouTube as well. Okay, um, and then someone is also wondering if you could reiterate that you found no significant risks of using poppers and Viagra. Um, sure. So, yeah, like I said, uh, there were claims that Viagra and poppers could be dangerous to be used together um, based on some sort of biological plausibility. So uh, they both lower blood pressure uh, so it's conceivable that this could interact with the heart. Um, generally, like I didn't find any information that had been published about this actually occurring in hospitals. So oftentimes when there's, you know, a rare presentation or some sort of unusual case, they will report it in the medical literature. Um, this is just not something that I observed. Um, yeah. Let me know if I can clarify that at all. Okay, and then someone just has an anecdotal piece here. Um, so someone mentioned that they had some instances from people being ripped off while trying to buy poppers online or from dealers, and that this information that is passed on to be careful about buying them. Um, let's see. Uh, and another question had been, uh, has there been any formal organization efforts to undo this ban? Um, there have, so there was an uh, online petition that was started, I think a few years ago. Uh, it didn't actually get off the ground really. Um, I think there were only a few people that ended up signing it, but there have been other people who've been vocal in the community about reversing the ban. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's another sort of uh, clarification or anecdotal piece here. So someone mentioned that buying online sometimes can be stopped by Canada Post. Right. So um, Health Canada is doing all that they can to prevent poppers from entering the country. So they have um, tried to work with border control, um, custom services to try to take poppers away at the border, and that goes for online orders as well. Um, but this isn't a criminal charge for people buying them or possessing them. This is just a border control issue that they're trying to uh, mitigate or trying to, I guess, follow up with. 
Great. Um, and then another clarification piece here. Um, are there guidelines for safer popper usage as well as buying or sourcing poppers? Um, there are resources online. I would suggest that there aren't a lot of great resources for safer, safer poppers use. This isn't an area that has been delved into very much. Um, and because the research is progressing through time, uh, some of the older resources that are available are slightly less valid than they originally would have been. Um, there is an online resource called Popper's Guide, so I cannot speak to you know, buying poppers online. I can't recommend sources, obviously, um, but there are online communities, forums and stuff that you can go to uh, that you know, might be a good option if that's something that you need more information on. Okay, so the next question here, are there certain uh, other substances that poppers are commonly used with? Um, this is a question that's come up before. Uh, I would say that there is, there aren't necessarily, you know, specific combinations that might be observed with other kinds of polysubstances or other, you know, drug combinations. Um, but it's safe to say, you know, poppers are used very widely. Um, there's a lot of reports of people using them with alcohol, for example, with other stimulants maybe like methamphetamine. Um, you know, I, I don't think culturally there's any tie between two uh, substances or other substances being used with poppers, but it does happen. All right, and another question, are dealers just making their own poppers? Um, again, again, this is something that I'm hesitant to declare a blanket statement on. Uh, there are definitely reports of people making their own poppers and selling them, but I think, you know, other people are bringing them across the border, other people are buying them online. The reality is, in terms of research or any kind of citable evidence, there hasn't been anyone that's really looked into this um, that definitively. Okay, so the next question here, apart from STI transmission, slash suppressing the immune system, are there any long-term effects for regular users? Um, it doesn't appear to be supported by a lot of evidence other long-term effects. Um, so I cited immunosuppression and increases in viral transmission because they seem to be the most obvious based on the research. Um, yeah, I don't think based on studies that I've encountered, there are other serious causes for concern long-term. But again, there, there's a general lack of research, um, and so this is, could be something that's encountered in the future. Um, the next question we have here, um, have there been any shifts in the use of poppers, for example, on the dance floor in the mid-80s to now only using for sex? Um, good question. So largely the cultural context is similar. So they're still used on the dance floor um, as they were in the 80s, for example. Obviously still used in sexual context quite commonly. Um, there's also reports, I think more recently, so one way they might be changing is that they're being used by, uh, you know, the general straight community, for example, like often young people especially in Europe, are being reported to use poppers kind of in music festival environments, that kind of thing. But by and large, they seem to still be uh, associated specifically with gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, and they still tend to be focused around nightlife communities and around you know, sexual context like bathhouse communities. Great. Um, so that seems to be all the questions that were asked in the chat box. I think we'll just wait a couple more minutes before we wrap up and to give everyone an opportunity to ask their questions.
Okay, um, so before we wrap up today, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that on behalf of CBRC, we're very proud of Cameron's work during his co-op placement with us. And so this is his last week and we want him to, we want to thank him for, for choosing us for, to, for his practicum placement. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so one more question actually did come in. Uh, has Hopper's training videos assisted in usage both in the straight and GB MSM communities? Um, right, so for those who are uh, not familiar with this, these are videos like often in like context of porn and stuff like that, there seems to be um, this culture of like poppers training. Um, so videos that have encouraged people to be exposed to more poppers. And so was the question just about whether the culture has changed or? Sorry, yeah, let me just re reiterate, reiterate that question. So the question was, um, has Popper's training videos assisted in usage both in the straight and GBMSM communities? Right, uh, I'm not sure what is meant exactly by assisted in use. Um, I think this is, from my understanding, like a fairly niche interest for some people. Um, but to be honest, I can't speak much to that. Um, yeah, I'm really not too sure. Um, so there's just an anecdotal piece here. Um, someone mentioned that in their work, they have seen an increase in more powerful substances as a substitute. Um, is there similar experiences in other MSM worker roles in the community? Um, yeah, good question again. So I'm not sure what's meant by more powerful substances, but there have been um, reports, especially in the United States, of people especially since their legislation uh, banning poppers, there have been other substances that have been taken up instead, so other kind of inhalant drugs. Um, and by and large, inhalants are known to be like quite harmful to the body and have like very few benefits, uh, whereas poppers are kind of separate and the risk-benefit ratio appears to be lots better. Um, so yeah, apart from substituting other inhalant drugs, I don't know too much about anything that's been recorded in terms of other like more powerful substitutes. Um, so a question here, can we give away poppers for free with no legal consequences? Um, Generally, I'm not a lawyer, so I just won't want to delve into too much of this. Um, my understanding is that generally giving away drugs can be considered selling um, or distributing. So I would not advise that if you're concerned about legal repercussions, no. All right, and someone wanted to add um, a piece about the online slang. There is something known as Popper baiting or gooning, uh, which is more of a UK term, and that it seems to involve pretty intensive popper use while masturbating. Um, and then another question here, uh, if poppers are a vascular dilator, is there an increased risk of bleeding? Um, so I don't think this has been something that's like, really studied properly, but generally, yes, there's an increased uh, risk for um, tearing of tissue. Uh, so in theory, yes, there's an increase in risk of bleeding, but whether or not this is something that's very significant, I think, you know, there hasn't been a lot of work to show that. Um, so there's a question here, uh, with the ban in place, how are people learning about poppers? 
So, you know, I think generally one common theme around poppers use is that they've been something because they're very commonly used within gay and other GBMSM communities. Um, there's a lot of cultural knowledge that transferred between members of the community, and I think that remains to be true today. Um, there's really not a lot of messaging, like I said, from the government. Um, there's not a lot of messaging um, from other health sources or other kind of like related information sources either around poppers use. Um, so I think, yeah, the biggest uh, means for communicating information around poppers has and still remains to be among gay men and among other men who have sex with men. Okay, great. great. That, that looks like all the questions that we have today. Um, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us this afternoon for the webinar on poppers, the ban on alkyl nitrites in Canada and its impacts on GBMSM health. health. Um, if you guys have any more questions, you can always send an email to Cameron. Um, and if for whatever reason I may have missed a question, um, if you want to send an email to Cameron as well, you can do that as well. Um, so we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, thanks, everyone.